Hi everyone, Professor King here. In this video, I'm going to be discussing Judith Butler's uh, text, Subversive Bodily Acts, in relation to uh, Isabel Allende's uh, chapters in the novel Ava Luna that we have been reading. Um, so I will take it to a share screen in just a moment, but I always like to remind you that, um, you know, if questions arise um, with these challenging texts, to please contact me via um, email, come to my Zoom office hours, however you can get a hold of me before the discussion boards are due so that um, you know, we can get clarification on these things because it's important. Um, so I'll take it to a share screen and then I'll jump to the PowerPoint right here. Um, all right, so this is Judith Butler's Subversive Bodily Acts. Um, first and foremost, some things I want to bring to your attention, um, you know, this kind of goes into the realm of gender and queer theory, um, a little bit of, but, but you'll see from the beginning, um, from the first half of this kind of longer theoretical reading that Butler takes from all, all different kinds. She takes from new historicism, she takes from, uh, Marxism, you know, like I said, gender and queer theory, even film studies. Um, so she's she's very well read in the, you know, when it comes to theoretical knowledge. Um, one other thing I'll say is um, the first half of this reading might be a little challenging for you because, um, again, if we think of it in terms of like the they say, I say model that some of you might be familiar with, the first half of this is Butler responding to a number of other theorists? You know, she even as far back as Rene Descartes, right? So she's responding to Descartes and Wittig and um, Foucault and all these people, right? Those are just a smidge of them. And so it can get a little challenging in the first half of this reading because she's essentially summarizing all of these different things that all of these different theorists are saying so that she can then dive into her argument, her I say, if you will, and um, present what she, um, what she has to say in synthesizing all of these ideas that came before her, right? And if we think about that in terms of constructing our essay, it's really interesting because that's what we do um, in our essays. You may read something like Judith Butler and go, oh, I could never write something like this. But in actuality, you are. You might not be writing with that sort of uh, dense theoretical language that she uses, but you're, you're making the same moves, right? You're taking outside source material and text material and research, and you are then applying that to the argument that you are coming up with. She does it in a slightly different format than is required at the 100 level because she's a theorist with a PhD who's been writing for years. And this is actually part of a book of hers. Um, so it's not like a, a, a class essay like, like yours would be. But those moves are still there, right? Developing an argument, having evidence to back it up, analyzing what it all means, right? And then concluding based on that. So I want you to think of that um, and to keep that in mind when you, um, when you approach Butler, because Butler is going to get to her argument in really the second half of this reading. And we're not used to that. We're used to thinking that everybody presents their argument in the first paragraph, and that's not necessarily the case, right? We do that. We do that when we submit essays uh, for evaluation in the 104 class, but not every writer is going to do that, right? So keep that in mind. And if it helps to, uh, when you're reviewing, you know, read the text once, and then when you review it, really focus on that second half, because that, that's where she really gets to uh, the the heart of, of, of what she has to say. All right, so let's talk subversive bodily acts. Well, first off, the body, right? Like the body is very important. So initially, um, like I said, Butler is interrogating the meanings, the limits, the boundaries of the body as defined by all of these different theorists, as defined by society, as defined by history, right? Um, so that's what she's doing in that first half is she's interrogating, okay, well, this person says the body's this, and this person says the body's that, and this, you know, Descartes says the body has this duality of, of, uh, 
you know, uh, body and consciousness, right? Um, you know, and all of these different theorists are going to have different, different uh, definitions. She's interrogating all of those. She's saying, okay, um, here's what all these people are, people are saying. Here's what I'm going to critique and then take from each of those, right? Finding that lack, in other words. Um, and historically, theory has considered the body on the basis of its limits, of its margins, of its boundaries, right? And she, again, all of these theorists she's talking about are, uh, are, are part of these theoretical movements, right? W whether they be structuralist, post-structuralist, new historicist, uh, feminist queer theory, et cetera, et cetera, right? So she's showing, in other words, with by addressing all of these writers, right? She is showing that there's been a lot of talk about the body, first off, right? And a lot of this talk has, has centered on um, looking at the body on the basis of its limitations, right? On the basis of its boundaries. Um, and these boundaries reflect that which is considered dangerous, right? Um, where powers influence, so to speak, uh, hits up against the individual, right? Um, that which is attributed power, that which is attributed vulnerability, vis-a-vis -vis sexual practices like exclusion, domination, social regulation, law, and control, right? And so um, I know this picture might make some of you squeamish, but really for, you know, roughly half the population, well, not half, but I would say like a quarter of the population existing right now, um, you know, this is a, a, a regular occurrence, which is, um, you know, menstruation. And so the, the point I want to bring up is this image, this is actually exer exerted from a little bit larger image of, of, of a woman sleeping. And this was uh, banned by Instagram, right? And so if we think about that in terms of um, some of the things that Butler is saying about the body, right? Um, there is, you know, this, this sort of alludes to that, that sentiment of, you know, um, women's periods needing to be like concealed or hidden, right? Like there's a, just very recently in film, there have been some, some interesting um, play, to use a Butlerian term, there's been some inter interesting play with the notion of the female period, because up until very recently, you don't see the period in film, right? Like it, it, you don't see menstrual blood, you don't see, um, uh, you know, a, a used uh, tampon or, 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 or pad or anything like that, right? And so if we're thinking about that in terms of power, in terms of boundaries, in terms of um, what is considered dangerous, right? Whom does that serve to not show this very, very regular, very mundane, very run-of-the-mill occurrence that happens to so many people? Um, why is it? Does it? Why does it seem dangerous, or does it make so many people uncomfortable just to view? Um, you know, the act of a period happening to, you know, to the body, from the body, through the body, however you want to, you want to discuss it, right? And so these are some of the boundary issues we're talking about, right? The boundary has been set up, in other words, by society. And each of these theorists that she's mentioning is kind of looking at these different boundaries in different ways. But ultimately, Butler is saying, well, why, right? Like, why are we looking at it in terms of a boundary when um, we can be looking at it again in another way? Um, when Butler starts to get into her own argument, right, she starts to talk about drag. Excuse me real quick, I'm gonna have some water. Um, And so there's, you know, drag is now in the mainstream in so many ways, but at the time of Butler writing this, drag was still something that was considered, you know, much more subversive uh, than, than it is currently. Um, and she says that dr drag is a great example of this notion of parody, right? In other words, it's imitating those aspects of gendered experience which are falsely naturalized as a unity 
through the regulatory fiction of heterosexual coherence. Well, what does that mean? What she's saying is, and we'll get to this a little bit more later, but let's just go with the traditional sort of, uh, or typical expectation of what we think when we, when we hear the word drag, right? Uh, we typically, and I'm not saying this is the case always, but we typically think of uh, people who identify as male uh, adorning themselves in the expected style of people who identify as female, right? Um, but it's not, it's not to, it's not to mock women, right? It's not to say that, that women are awful and we're going to wear these clothes as a way of ridiculing, uh, you know, the feminine or the female, um, instead, it's this play, right? It's this celebration. It's this pushing of boundaries. It's the subversive act that says, why is this something that that is only allowable, right, to people who identify in a very specific and narrow portion of the gender spectrum? Um, and how can we play with this, right? And so this image right here is a very famous uh, contemporary drag queen by the name of Bob the Drag Queen, right? And if you even just think about that name, right? Like Bob is this very stereotypically old fashioned male like dad name, right? And it is actually the real name of the person performing the drag, but you know, Bob the Drag Queen is in itself a sort of play, a sort of parody, right? Like, like these gender expectations that we have with the name Bob, and then we see uh, this individual here um, are that play, right? And so um, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of interesting uh, takeaways, but it just, you know, that's where Butler starts. And again, I'll talk more about this in a moment. Butler also talks about this notion of pastiche, which is less playful than parody. It's parody that's lost its humor. Um, it's an imitation of a centerless copy. So in other words, it implies that, and this is what Butler's getting at, these, this behaved gender is not even, you know, try as we might to, to imply that it is indicative of some innate gender it doesn't, right? There's too much slippage going on, right? And so ultimately gender is a stylized repetition of repeated public acts that are socially temporal and legitimized. And it's not a seamless discrete identity. And, you know, we're, we are in some ways we're fortunate enough to be living in 2020 for Butler to make more sense um, to a broader public than she did when she first came out. So think about this. Gender is a stylized repetition of repeated public acts that are socially temporal, meaning they're fleeting, right? They're changing, they're always changing, but they're also legitimized when they exist. And so if you think of, um, you know, if you think of somebody who um, tries to maintain like a, a frail frame and has, you know, large breasts, lots of makeup, long hair that's styled very high, thick eyelashes, uh, you know, painted lips, uh, small waist, all of these, you know, uh, manicured hands and feet, like all of these things, they're stylized, but they're acts, right? They are behaviors. That same person could gain lots of weight, could, you know, um, either, you know, duct tape their chest down or just not purchase, you know, and, 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 and uh, surgically implant a chest, right? Could not wear any makeup, could not grow their hair long, right? All of those things that imply a, an innate gender that innate gender is not really there. It's a centerless copy, right? Um, in and of itself. It, it, this kind of goes back to Nietzsche, right? Like this idea that there was some sort of original basis there, that that thing in and of itself was a metaphor, right? Um, and so 
all of this is behaved, right? So gender is not a discrete seamless identity. In other words, if we are not born biologically gendered, then it's performed, it's behaved, right? Um, you know, I have long hair, I dye my hair, I'm not wearing any makeup right now, right? I have a t-shirt on, um, you can't see, but I'm, I mean, I'm trying to look professional somewhat, um, you know, but I, I'm wearing men's pajama pants, right? Like, does that mean that, um, however I, I identify, right, um, is, is affected by that? Well, no, according to Butler, right? Because how I identify is how I identify. Um, so let's think of some, cause she, you know, she's really dense. So I wanna unpack some of these, uh, some of these quotes she uses, right? First she says, acts, gestures, and desire produce the effect of an internal gender substance through the play of signifying absences and thus are performative. This is like, you know, again, really what we're getting to when we're talking about Butler. And if, as you'll see, if you have the second edition, um, but as you'll know, it's in the second half of this reading. So gender is performed repeatedly, right? Not just once, right? It's performed repeatedly. Um, and I'll hold off there for a second, right? Um, the next thing she says, right? The construction of coherence, the construction, right? Again, something that's created, it's not inherent, it's not innate. The construction of coherence conceals the gender discontinuities that run rampant within sexual orientations. Well, now we're kind of alluding back to uh, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, right? Because, um, and I'll give you an example of this so that it kind of makes sense. Um, I have a friend who is a trans woman and she was uh, assigned male at birth and uh, lived in the closet for years as, you know, uh, presenting as male. Um, and then she, she finally came out uh, as female. She's lived a life as a woman openly for very many years. Uh, but one thing that's interesting about her is that she still identifies as gay. She's attracted to men. Um, she, she identifies as gay. And so someone looking at that might say, well, you know, you're a woman, you know, you, you say you're a woman, you're attracted to men, you're not gay, but there is that slippage. There's that slippage because for so many years when she, when she lived, you know, her dead name and her dead life, um, in a masculine, uh, sort of, uh, portrayal to the world, right? She was still attracted to men. And so the queerness that she experienced as both before and after <laughs> her, her public transition, right? She was always, she always identified as a woman in her heart, but um, the transition, for, you know, that, that everyone else experienced, <laughs> I guess you would say, uh, the, the public transition was years later uh, uh, after her birth. So, um, this is what, this is what Butler is, is, is sort of alluding to, right? Is like, there are, if gender is a spectrum, if sexuality is a spectrum, then when we have heterosexual, bisexual, pansexual, homosexual, right? All of these sorts of things, there's going to be a lot of variance there, right? And so, building on Sedgwick, right? If it, or really come coming before Sedgwick, but kind of in conjunction with what Sedgwick, Sedgwick says, if we are looking at this together, then we can see that, yeah, right? Like if, if, if there's a lot of gender slippage to begin with, uh, th then that's, you know, these designations of sexualities that we've, that we've, uh, created are going to have some, some slippage too. Um, and then finally, um, think about this, 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 this final statement, not final statement, but final for this page 
uh, the Butler stage. She says, these acts and gestures create the illusion, create the illusion of an interior and organizing gender core for the purposes of the regulation of sexuality within the obligatory frame of reproductive sexuality, heterosexuality. Well, now we're going back to Foucault, right? Like we need to conform to this, to this very uh, outdated notion of reproductive heterosexual binaries, right? And so we do that by acts, by gestures, by creating an illusion that there is some sort of woman inside this frame, right? Um, and, and it's to regulate sexuality. But if we, again, if gender is a spectrum, if sexuality is a spectrum, it's a lot more difficult to regulate, uh, you know, those, those entities in terms of labeling them, in, in terms of giving them names, in terms of uh, legally regulating them, right? Who has rights, who has, doesn't, cetera, who doesn't, et cetera, et cetera. If, if we acknowledge the complexity, the complexity is what makes it very difficult, right? Um, to, to get into that binaristic way of thinking as it should, right? We sh the binary, you know, that doesn't allow for complexity um, really gets us to fall into a lot of uh, traps of fallacies of argument. So, you know, keep those in mind. Um, where was I going? I'm lost kind of, no, I'll come back. Um, but yeah, this idea of an illusion of an interior and organizing gender core. And I'm gonna get real, I'm gonna get 100% real with you all right now. When I was younger, I was very, uh, I was very, I guess you would say tomboyish, I guess that's the right word, but I also was like, um, you know, I also had a lot of feminine characteristics. And so for years, I mean, well into high school, I really wondered if I just didn't have a gender. Like I, I would wake up and I would experience the world and I would say to myself, I mean, this is years before ever reading Butler or any of this stuff. And I would just say like, I don't feel like a woman, but I also don't feel like a man. I just kind of feel like this entity experiencing the world. And some of those things that I had to do to show or prove that I was a woman, you know, they were really laborious and sort of uh, pointless to me, you know, like shaving my legs or, um, you know, having to act coy or when, you know, raising my voice when I was around certain people, it just felt ridiculous. And I, I went along with it because I figured, you know, that's what I'm supposed to do. You know, I performed these, these, uh, these gendered behaviors and it just always felt weird, you know? And then there were other behaviors that I didn't perform that I was roundly sort of, uh, policed for, right? Like, um, I would talk, you know, I was uh, clearly, I was the kid in class who would be like, oh, let's talk about blah, 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 right? And I was very aggressive and uh, um, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't concede a lot when I was with, when I was in the confines of the classroom. And so people would see that as very like non-feminine behavior. Um, I don't like getting my nails done. I, like, I don't like doing my feet. Um, I swear a lot. So a lot of people, even my age, you know, people close to their forties have problems with that because I'm not performing this sort of gendered expectation or even teaching, right? Like, oh, don't be super nice to everybody. I mean, I guess I'm nice, but like, you know, I don't like I don't act like a mommy. And so people have a problem with that. Like these weird gender expectations um, that all, that make everybody in society feel maybe more comfortable in a certain way because it's a pattern and our brains need patterns. And so like, if they see woman and I act woman, then it's like, 
that made it a lot easier for me than, you know, that person challenging this very static and stable understanding of that gender that I have, right? Um, so that's just like one example of, of where you might see some of this stuff. And the great thing is that each one of you, whether you want to admit it out loud or not, have had a similar sort of experience where you were like, oh, they, you know, they told me I wasn't man enough, or they told me to man up, or, you know, they, they said that I was weird because I was, I didn't, they couldn't tell what gender I was, you know, or whatever. Um, you know, we all have that. And it kind of probably felt crummy when we were being policed for it. And when I say policed, I mean, like, stay in line, right? Like, do this thing according to what people expect of it. Um, but at the same time, to acknowledge that that is that slippage, right, is is an example of of what Butler's talking about is like, oh, that makes sense, right? Anyway, I'll um, I'll move on. Um, I also also a couple more things that Butler says to to you know that are challenging, but we'll kind of break it down here. And this kind of goes right along with what I was talking about in the previous slide, that gender performance has punitive consequences, right? We regularly punish those who fail to do their gender right in order to compel our belief in its necessity and naturalness. In other words, if Katie at 14 doesn't fully act like a frilly, dilly, gilly girl, uh, Katie at 14 is going to, you know, be rejected by, by, dudes she's into or her parents are going to call her a weirdo or whatever right um so we punish those who fail to do their gender right and she's saying that ironically right in order to compel our belief in its necessity and naturalness like because we right we the 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 observers are uncomfortable we don't want that slippage and complexity we want everything wrapped up in a nice little bow, right? We want to make that pattern and make it stick because when it doesn't, the whole foundation of our understanding of society, at least in terms of gender, is like thrown up right into the air and we go, <gasps> right? Um, but is that really a big deal? Anyway, that's, that's me digressing. Um, and a really famous example of this, um, a, 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 a contemporary, uh, gender non-binary, gender queer person um, who, ha who has a really big social media presence and following is the person on the left here. Um, I think it's your left, it might be your right. I can never remember. Um, Alok, Alok Manon, um, A-L-O-K-M-E-N-O-N. -O um, and Alok, uh, been interviewed by Jonathan Van Ness, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of friends with Sam Smith, like a lot of sort of really influential, uh, people in, 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 you know, whatever the industry, um, Alok talks about how they have, um, experienced countless punitive consequences because they've not performed gender correctly. Right. Alok does, uh, Alok was assigned male at birth, but, but is, is, you know, uh, performs any number of, of gender performances. Right. Um, whatever they prefer. Um, and so to think about, you know, um, and, and sometimes it's bullying, sometimes it's death threats, sometimes it's um, very severe things, right? Because people are so afraid of getting out of their, their comfort zone or their expectation level. Um, all right, so the other quote from, from from Butler is if gender transformation is to be found in the arbitrary relation between gendered acts in the possibility of a failure to repeat a deformity or a parodic repetition that exposes gender fender, gender's artificial nature. If that's all the case, according to Butler, what might that look like? Well, we have one example here with a Logmanon, right? But let's think of some other examples where, you know, people either verbally or through their acts, right? Through their speech acts, through their behavior, actually stand up and say, I'm not gonna repeat this gendered expectation, right? I'm going to deform the way that this gendered body is supposed to look, right? I'm going to parodically repeat what you expect of 
this particular gendered group to to behave or look like, right? Um, I'm going to show that this is all artificial, right? That none of this, all this BS about like men and women and men do this and women do that, like it's hogwash. What might that look like? Maybe take a moment, think about it. And then finally, as always, we have to talk about it in terms of the novel, right? And so um, I want you to consider characters and consider societal expectations, right? Um, within the novel, right? Are there characters who fail to perform their gender according to society's expectations? Who are they? How do they do it? And why do you think they're doing it? Um, clearly we have the character of, of Malesio or Mimi, um, who is probably the most prominent example of this, but I want you to think of other ones as well. Um, and then what are these gender slippages? What, whether they're voluntary, like whether they're on purpose or whether they're not on purpose, what do they say about the character or the society in which they live, right? Um, because again, right, a lot of this, a lot of this ideology is behaved, is practiced, right? When we think about ideology, we think it's like imposed, right? Like an Orwellian sort of like, you must do this. And not all the time, right? Most of the time it's actually us with our manufactured consent going, oh, like, you know, Katie at 14 going, oh, I guess this is what girls do, right? Like, oh, I'll, I'll start talking like this, right? Like, or whatever. Um, so what does that say about me? What does that say about the society in which I live, right? Do that, but do it in the context of, of Ava Luna, right? And the chapters, any of the chapters we've read so far up to, I think we're at three or four or something. I, don't know, I can't count. So I'm an English professor, not a math teacher. Um, all right. So I hope that I'm going to take it off. Stop share now. I hope that made sense. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Again, any questions or comments, um, just feel free to contact me and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day and evening. <laughs>